So both back doors are open. Right? Leave them that way or leave them in one of them so that people can come in. Okay, I'm going to do one quick volume check. Can you hear me back there? You Now you can. Well, it was no different. We didn't change the volume. It's just the actor that's performing. All right, real quick, we're going to get started. It is now 2.59. Um, I'm going to ask three things. These are wonderful. I love these products. I don't want to hear it. Please mute, turn it off, throw it out the window. Please, let's not interrupt the program. Okay, I see people doing that. Oh, I hear those chimes. Nice. Okay, the second thing that I'm going to ask is in my meetings, in the meetings that we hold, yes. There's only one conversation going on, and if it's not mine, I'll approve the person that's going to be speaking. So let's not have little chit-chats. If you want to have a little confab, the doors are right over there. Please do it. Let's not disturb and be rude to our neighbors. Okay? Oh, crap. Get my hands off the table. Yes, thank you. Okay, the next requirement is, especially for new people, if there is an alarm, we all know to stay put. Okay, once we get instructions on what's happening, where to go and what to do, just follow me out the door. But stay put. Okay. It is now three o'clock and I call the Residents Association of Woodland Pond, second quarter, June 26th, meeting to order. All right. This is your 2024 Residents Council. We have a few members who are missing, but in the meantime, would they all stand up, please? Dave, myself over here. They work very hard for you, and we appreciate you telling them what you think. All right? Okay. Dave, lights, please. All right. Today's theme, and you may have heard it yesterday very, very strongly from Michelle, is this is going to be about the outdoors at Woodland Pond. All right? We're going to delve into things that maybe we've always talked about inside, but we're going to talk about outside today. And it's been hot. I chose this symbol about a month ago when we were starting to prepare this. I didn't have any idea that I was going to bake everybody out. But our agenda this morning is going to be 
I'm going to be real quick. Don't cheer, everybody. Don't cheer. But I'm going to be real quick. Talk about what's happening here at Woodland Pond. We're going to talk about trails. We're going to talk about garden demonstration plots. And as I always have, and I always promise, there will be time for Q&A. So please hold on to those questions and let us tell you what we're going to tell you. Then you can ask about it. Okay, let's talk about Woodland Pond. Uh, as of the 14th of June, when I got this information, we had 265 residents in independent living and 89 in the health center. I saw this character of the people and I thought, yeah, that's Woodland Pond. You know, it's new line dancing or square dancing. But really when I looked at it, I thought, nope, that's the group going to the complimentary wine tasting and uh, don't get in their way. All right, this is the information people always kind of think about and talk about. This is the new resident, new independent living owners. I don't know if they're couples or singles, but this is the number of closings that have happened up till this month, June, uh, and so far we're on track to probably exceed the 30, 39 that we have. So again, there is very um, good turnover. We are having problems with the uh, mechanical staff because of illnesses and stuff like that. We can't get the um, new, new apartments ready in, and uh, they're working on trying to resolve that. Okay, the other thing is to look at the number. Uh, the health center is not full, but it is running very much at their targeted capacity. Uh, skilled nursing, uh, they have a target of having 30 beds in use at all times. Maximum is 40, we're at 34. Um, assisted living, again, we have 40 beds. Uh, we're now uh, have 38 occupied. Just in the back over there. Um, and in memory care, we have 17 out of the 20. So um, that's the complexion of the uh, residents here at Woodland Pond. Next question is, okay, how, how are things made up? I was wrong the other night, my friend, I apologize. There are th a third of us male, two thirds female. So we understand decisions should be slanted that way. I, I will tell you that. Then we have 25% couples, 75% singles. This is all independent living, not characterizing the health center. All right, one of the, the keys that we talk about a lot is, um, and that's not the line getting into the uh, pack for uh, one of these presentations. This symbolizes, here's, here's the situation that we have now. We have 62 firm contracts for waiting to join us here at Woodland Pond. Okay, all of the units, all of the models, I should say, have been spoken for. Um, I know you'll look around and say, well, this one's empty, that one's empty. But according to finance, they're all spoken for. Predominance, as you can see, is at the heavy end, I want to say heavy, the large units, oaks, the dogwoods, and the white birch. So this is where we are today. I expect this will stay. Um, through the balance of the year, but that's living here in Woodland Pond. Now, as I mentioned, this is the sun that we have that's baking us. Please be careful. We're going to talk about trails. There's one trail that's pretty near us. Here's another trail. Not quite, but I understand our guest speaker had some involvement with that trail, Oregon Trail. Didn't you live there? Yes. Okay, well, I'm not gonna 
say that you've developed it. Okay. Just to get it straight. And then the other trail that we all love is the Yellow Brick Road Trail. All right. But in the spotlight, I present to you our one and only Larry Randall to take you through the trails. This is a conflict. You see two old men trying to scoot around each other. Wow. Am I now on? Yes. yes. Not loud enough? Am I mean, loud enough now? Better? Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to be talking to you today about what I'm calling the Woodland Pond Trail Improvement Project. And this will concentrate on the pair of trails. Whoop. Well, what happened there? Yeah, I'm trying to back it up. Ah, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Right, yeah, okay. So, as I was saying, the uh, trail that we've, we'll be speaking about two trails today, uh, both of which are represent one continuous trail running uh, around below all of the cottages from one end to the other. Uh, you'll see at the purple X up the top that represent, <coughs> represents the start of what's called a branch trail named after the Eagle Scout for whose project it was to develop it. And it moves down toward the green X where it meets the McBride Trail at what we call the observation platform. And that McBride Trail, which was, by the way, was named after a early resident who was very much involved in trails here and hiking in general. And then we also have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, highlighted the uh, Dan and Ray Smith Beaver Pond, uh, after which, you know, if you're calling yourself Woodland Pond, you've got to have a pond. And so we have a beaver pond. Uh, represented by Mr. Beaver up there off to the left in the yellow box. Okay, why improve the trails? We want to make them as accessible as possible to as many residents as possible. At the present, the trails are little more than tracks in the woods, muddy and uneven with unstable planks on muddy stretches. And this is a uh, example of a portion of the trail. Another example, back in 2023, with the blessing of management, the Land Conservation Committee, of which I am currently the chair, uh, procured a preliminary cost estimate for what it would take to improve the trails. We submitted an application for a grant, which unfortunately was unsuccessful. Earlier this year, management from the Land Conservation Committee got actively behind the trail project and engaged the services of an outfit called Tahawas Trails Sorry. to develop a design proposal. The resulting document, by the way, a copy of that document is right on our lovely flower bouquet table right up front here. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, design uh, proposal resulted in uh, being the basis for a request for bids and several bids were received and a contract was awarded last month to a local company which has had previous excellent experience here at Woodland Pond. Now work has actually begun as of a week ago and here is an example of the initial part of the work that has to be done 
They have to scrape down to smooth the trail and remove some of the obvious obstacles. And then they will have to proceed to develop the uh, real surface of the trail on top of that. Now the trails will be built to something called the US Forest Service standards. There's the website if you really feel like indulging yourself in bureaucratic ease. And they, they, uh, the specs uh, call for particular uh, materials, uh, maximum grades, uh, what you deal with, how you deal with water, et cetera. And the specifications, while rather vigorous, are not fully in compliance with ADA standards. Permanent paving, for example, under ADA, that would not be appropriate in a woodland setting. It would also be far more expensive than any other way of doing it. And most importantly, it would not be permitted under the governing conservation easement. Why a conservation easement, you ask? <clears throat> Can't Woodland Pond do what it likes on its own property? In a word, no, it cannot. The easement is a legally binding agreement limiting the changes or improvements that we, Woodland Pond, can make on specific portions of its property. Of course, that does not include the area that is currently uh, devoted to independent living in the health center, but the wooded areas uh, both in front of the campus, between the campus and uh, North Putt Road, and more extensively, the property behind the cottages. Those are both subject to, to two different easements. If you want know, to know more about those easements and who, they con who controls them and so on, the Land Conservation Committee talk on July 16th here in the PAC will feature the director of the Walk Hill Valley Land Trust, which, and she will discuss the uh, many protected lands that the trust oversees, which include the two woodland pond parcels covered by easements. No longer will the McBride and Branch Trails be narrow with encroaching vegetation, trip hazards, and semi-permanent muddy areas. Here is an example of the work that is now underway. You can see at the upper half of the uh, photo, uh, a, uh, a graded section, which is otherwise not yet been worked on. And in the foreground, <clears throat> you can see where an initial layer of gravel has been spread over the leveled portion. And here's an example of where, if you look in the lower portion of the screen, uh, you can see an, a culvert, which has been placed underneath the trail so that any uh, water that comes down will be funneled off of the trail, underneath the trail, and will not erode the trail itself and cause muddy stretches. This is an example, this is not Woodland Pond, this is an example of a, uh, a trail that was done in, uh, on Bear Mountain, south of here, uh, and this is a typical uh, trail after the rehabilitation that we are having uh, performed. Our trail may not look exactly like this, but this is a fair representation. Now here you can see how, how close uh, our natural area is to residential area. Those are some cottages up above there. And we want to encourage residents and their families to get closer to nature. Now here is the map again, up to the upper right corner, you see the purple X, and that will be the start of the branch trail. And in the uh, photo, you'll see the approximate location of the start of that trail. There will be other trails, there are already other trails down in our wooded area, but those will certainly for the time being remain unimproved. Uh, this is the start of what we call Keith's Way, which has been named for a former chair of the Land Conservation Committee. One reason to limit the amount of trail improvement is to ensure that we do not violate the terms of our easement. Now, you'd be interested to know that if you wish to explore further using our trails, that you can easily get onto our immediate adjoining preserve, the Millbrook Preserve, 
which is represented by that rather irregular olive green shape. Um, and that's a joint uh, property owned by the town and the village of New Paltz and it is a nature preserve. And the various dotted lines you see represent the various trails which are in place already in the preserve. I assure you that those trails will not be as well improved as what ours will be like when it is finished. Uh, the purple arrow there points you to the general area of where we are, Woodland Pond. <clears throat> and here is a group of residents who went down to the observation platform earlier this month. And in the background, uh, you can just make out a partial body of water. And that is, again, the Ann and Ray Smith Beaver Pond. The platform was built in 2013 by the help, with the help of the Bruderhof. <clears throat> and you can see the little plaque we have affixed to the railing on the platform. And uh, it's not the way it looks today, that's for sure. But, uh, <laughs> but I just wanted to point out that uh, the beaver pond is very attractive in all seasons of the year. And if you have the proper footwear and clothing, and experience to do this, uh, you can easily go more, it'll be more e easy to get down there on the, uh, on the new trail when it's finished. So you can explore what our property looks like in other seasons. And if you look carefully in the distance, the yellow arrow points out the beaver lodge. Uh, if you have a beaver pond, it's a pretty good safe bet that you'll have beavers. Now, the, uh, I think I mentioned earlier that the two trails, Branch and McBride, meet uh, right near, nearby to the observation platform. And if you continue along the McBride Trail, you'll come to what we call the retention pond. The retention pond is not thanks to beavers. It is where storm overflow has to uh, flow in order to uh, not uh, inundate the residential part of our property. But it's also, it's quite attractive and the, there's a, a, a grassy path that goes around it. And uh, if you see that yellow dotted line that just appeared, that's the approximate location of the current trail, uh, including the portion that will be worked on over the next few days or week. As you approach the end of the McBride Trail, you'll see a few things of interest. There's a picnic table down there. Uh, that's courtesy of Maddie Lee, who had it created and placed uh, as a memorial to her late husband. And there's also a, a canoe and kayak rack down there. So that folks, there are several residents here who engage in those kinds of activities. And they now have a place to keep their uh, vehicles or vessels, as you call them. And there's also a bench. <clears throat> Here is the south end of the McBride Trail. It's right off of Dan Skin Way between cottages eight and 10. That's cottage 10 right there. And we have now gone from one end of the, the combined trails to the other. And uh, you can walk them, of course, in either direction. You can walk them most just down to the platform and come back or any old, any variation you like. And we hope that once the trail is finished in the next week or two, uh, you will take advantage and make use of it and go explore it. And I want to thank these people in particular for contributing to this presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. We'll hold questions to the end, please. Okay, next, Don Sangri will take us through the development program um, of our test gardens.
First, we'll have to do a sound check because we always have this thing about my voice. Can you hear me in the back? Oh, good. Who said no? All right. Okay. Um, story of the demonstration gardens. Sustainability encompasses so many aspects of our life here. Saving the earth is a big job. It's easy to feel overwhelmed and discouraged. What helps the sustainability committee to function and feel not overwhelmed is picking something specific to work on. So we have a group of specific projects that we're working on right now. And this year, my specific thing has been alternatives to grass. We've been working to focus, to zero in on specific goals. The Alternative to Grass team voted at a recent meeting in favor of three goals this year. Go back to my goals. Watch that. <laughs> um, we're going to establish and monitor four test gardens. They have been planted with native pollinators, perennials, grasses, and ground covers. And I brought you some samples of the flowers that are blooming now. We're going to research alternatives to the current lawn treatment plan and make recommendations. And we're going to inform Woodland, Woodland Pond residents about the importance of pollinator habitats and the reduction of turf, turf grass on our grounds. So today I'm reporting on goal one while working on goal three. We have amazing gardens all over our campus. Landscape borders around the buildings, our community gardens, cottage gardens, the garden view garden, individual beds around the doorsteps of apartments with outside access. We also have three established native gardens. Mark Eisen has ha Handler, our horticulturalist, planted a prairie garden on the South Slope four years ago and it is uh, now mature. Ray Smith has a cottage garden at in Cottage 8 that's been there since he moved in. And I planted a native garden on the south retaining wall between the first and second floors three years ago. All the native gardens that were picked this morning are from those three gardens. There are three resident association committees that take care of our gardens. There's a garden committee, there's a landscape committee and the sustainability committee. We all work with management to achieve our common goals. Woodland Pond looks like a gardener's paradise. Abundant sunshine, great swaths of open land, neat beds around the cottages and the ground floor apartments. But here's a dirty little secret. The soil here is terrible. The buildings were erected on construction fill. So if you dig down three or four inches, you hit clay and rock and construction debris. So you can't really grow anything here without adding topsoil. When I put in my native garden, I added five cubic yards of topsoil to, to a 200 square foot bed. That's a lot of dirt. The story of our test gardens begins more than two years ago when members of the sustainability committee complained repeatedly about the lawn treatment program here. At every meeting, people were urging the committee to find alternatives to these herbicides and pesticides. Dog owners wanted to protect their dogs from walking these chemicals. We knew that they killed bees and other valuable insects. We asked Tom Tango and Michelle Gramolia, who sit on the sustainability committee, to come up with another way to treat the grass. Tom said he was perfectly willing to consider an alternative product if we could suggest one. The problem was that these so-called organic products cost a lot more than the already pricing materials he was using on the lawns. And the companies that made the organic products, wait for it, required that he sign a document that said he knew they might not work. 
Under these circumstances, Tom was unwilling to make a change. At this point, Michelle said, why don't we consider alternatives to the grass? We'll never be able to replace all the lawn, and we don't want to do that. But suppose we wanted to reduce the lawn areas. What kinds of plants could we put in place of the grass? A sustainability team came together to work with Mark Eisenhandler. As we talked and did research and visited pollinator gardens in the area, we began to reimagine our lawns, not only to avoid pesticides and herbicides, but also to bring Woodland Ponds landscape into better ecological health. Why do we want to replace the turf grass? Lawn grass is a monoculture. It's one thing, one species. Think golf course. Think putting green. Nature loves diversity and wildness and abundance of different species. So turf grass is essentially an unnatural landscape. It requires mowing, blowing, edging, trimming, all those noisy gas guzzling machines. It requires herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers to stay alive. If you let the grass grow, it would be food for cows. But here, we don't have any cows. Lawns also require regular watering. So this spring, the grass looked fabulous because it was so wet. But as soon as it got hot and dry, the grass dried up. The fact that it's planted in really bad soil doesn't help. Why do we want to plant more native gardens? They feed bees and beetles and caterpillars and butterflies and moths. These insects are pollinators essential for plant reproduction. My native garden is full of bees and butterflies today. Insects are also food for birds. Established native gardens require little maintenance. They are beautiful, full of diversity, bloom throughout the spring, summer, and fall. They're loaded with food for the many species who share our home with us. You may have seen in last Sunday's New York Times the article, What's Behind the Decline of Butterflies? It reported that while climate change and habitat loss are important, the biggest impact on the size and diversity of butterfly populations is agricultural insecticides, not unlike the lawn treatment that's coming our way again on June 28th. Last year, the team decided to create some demonstration gardens to try out different kinds of native plants. Four sites were selected, two on the south slope where it is hot and dry, and two on the north slope, where it is cooler and wetter. Tom Tango agreed to retain a landscape architect to design the gardens. Barbara Restaino, a, a local professional, was hired. She created four different landscape plans for the demonstration plots. Plot one shows a mix of drought-resistant native perennials and grasses. Plot two includes a mix of native shrubs and grasses. Plot three features plugs, which are baby plants, of fast-growing native ground covers. And plot four, which is partly shaded, includes a woodland mix of native perennials and sedges. In addition to the plans, Barbara provided pictures and descriptions of each of the plants. This information is available in the Woodland Pond Library on the sustainability shelf. Barbara's landscape plants were unveiled during Earth Week 2024 by a proud team of resident volunteers, some of whom have been working on this project for two years. I'd like to ask them to stand up right now. If you're in the room and you're part of my team, stand up. Once Barbara had given us the plans, Mark Eisenhandler had to source the plants, and it was already spring. The best time to source plants for a garden is December. 
So he was working at a great disadvantage trying to find the plants that Barbara had said she wanted in, in April. In Yeah, in April. Um, he finally found them mostly at Victoria's Garden in Rosendale. A machine came on May 2nd. Let's see the machine. We were so excited. The machine came on May 2nd to dig up the turf. The plants, the beds were planted and resident volunteers agreed to help care for them by watering and weeding. Already we have seen progress in bed three. This is bed three on this side. It looks a little sad there, but already we've seen progress because uh, the plants have gotten a little more mature. And that's the next slide, I hope. No, no, <laughs> Not, never mind. Give me the next one. <laughs> yeah, there they are. <laughs> These are the baby plants uh, a couple weeks. Uh, I don't know how much later, but sometime later, uh, they're looking a little more robust. The thing about plugs is that they're really tiny. And, and when you first put them in the ground, it just looks like they're all going to die there. But they're not. They're coming along nicely. So there they are. That's bed three. Yes. We also plan to monitor the insects that visit the beds. There they are. Anita Collins, a new resident who is a bee expert, will catalog the bees who visit the beds. There she is. Would you like to stand, Anita? <laughs> <laughs> Later, our test gardens will demonstrate alternatives for future landscape planning, both here on the existing campus and on the grounds of the proposed extension. We're not going to make the same mistakes when we build again that we made the last time. Michelle said, we're not going to make the same mistakes twice. We're not going to try to build a garden on construction debris. We're going to put down some good topsoil, and we're going to put down many more gardens and much less grass. Thanks to our collaboration with Michelle, Tom, and Mark, and to the hard work of our team, we will be able to offer more alternatives to the grass. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, a weed is a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered. To some people, native gardens look like a bed of weeds. Differences of opinion abound about this project. Some want all the grass to stay right where it is. Others are in favor of trying out some alternatives. The team is committed to answering questions and listening to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, if we could have the lights. Okay, while I amble over here, I want to say two things. Um, you've heard from two of our residents two with passion, two with commitment, two people that lead a committee. The committee they lead got involved with management. And guess what? Management listened. Management heard their views and direction. Management took it. This is the beauty of working or living here, I think, at Woodland Pond. Put it together, bring it to management, talk it through, and they will listen. Maybe it's a field of dreams. I don't know, but they will come. The second thing is we are really uh, fortunate to have all of this going on. And I look and hope all of you have an opportunity to express your ideas of what you would like us to do next. Um, Give us the, some suggestions. We would love to hear from you. Uh, I will tell you this right now. September's session 
is going to be tied in with, guess what? We're having a birthday. We're going to have a 15th anniversary here. And management is preparing for a very spectacular gala. And we're going to tag along with it because ours comes the next day. But we're going to we're going to do something different for Resonance Association. But at this time, as I promised, we have plenty of time. And don't all raise your hand at once. But yes, Anita, you have. I'm, I'm going to give her the first one. Right, you did ask, and you are part of the presentation. Please. Well, this is such a large crowd, and there may be some new people that when you begin to speak, just say your name so that folks know who you are. Hi, I'm a newbie. My name's Anita Collins. And thank you. Um, I have not just experience with honeybees, but after I retired, I did volunteer work the Soil Conservation Service, who survey a lot of other things. Or no, it's the Geologic Survey, excuse me. I surveyed native bees in eastern Pennsylvania. Dawn has already mentioned the fact that there's a lot of bees in her native plot. So sometime soon, we will be putting out some little plastic Dixie cup kind of things that are painted on the inside blue, which is attractive to bees. They are what we call a pit trap. They'll be full of a, a soapy water solution and the bees, some of, a few of the bees will be attracted to them and drown in them. That does not have a major impact on the natural population, okay? And the only way I can identify, as well as I can, what's foraging out there is to look at them under a microscope and count hairs and toes and things like that. So if you see a little cup that's blue, on the inside, don't move it. Don't step on it, please. We will be collecting them and I will be doing my best to do an identification and I'll give a talk and tell you what's out there, okay? There's um, 300 and something native bees in New York State. So there could be a lot of different things out there. If you don't bother them, they do not bother you. Don't try and grab them. Don't swat at them. Most of them are what we call solitary bees. It's a single female who makes a nest somewhere and she's out foraging for food for the few eggs she lays. So she's not interested in bothering you. So if you leave her alone, most of the time she'll leave you alone. Okay, not many of them are particularly defensive because it's just a, for the most part, it's just a single female, with the exception of the bumblebees, the big fuzzy ones. They do have small colonies. I think that's what I have to say, and I'll bring the results back to you at the end of the summer and let you know what's out there. Thank you, Anita. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank very, you. very good. So we had three, we had three sections to the presentation. Uh, questions on any? I, uh, before, before we take any more questions, I just saw Mark Eisenhandler. Mark, would you please stand up? Yes. Without this man, none of this happens. He is the supervisor, the encourager, the one who knows everything. And um, I am so grateful to him. Thanks, Mark.
Okay, hands up. Come, coming see. over your shoulder, Bill. I had two questions. One, I'm confused. Is the river pond the same as Woodland Pond? Yes, there is no Woodland there Pond. There is no Woodland right? Pond except in the name of Woodland Pond. There's no map that says Woodland Pond on it that identifies that, that, that piece of water. When we named this the Ray Ann and Ray Smith Beaver Pond, I contacted the village of New Paltz and asked how we go about having this name put on a map. And they said there is no way. You just have to Google comes along and does it and puts it on maps. There is no place called the Woodland Pond that they water. Is that an answer? So there's only two ponds down there, the Beaver Pond and the Retention Pond. <laughs> you got me. All right. All right. The second question is, how much topsoil did you have to put in for the demonstration gardens? Mark, we didn't. Yeah. yeah you, we, you, I, I, I get you. Um, for most, but it's yeah, better fine. better for all. Everybody. It's for the uh, video people. We need to have it. Yeah. So we put roughly five yards of um, topsoil in um, to add back to what we took when we scraped the the uh, turf off. And then we also added another five to seven yards of aged horse manure to those plots to add some organic component. Now, some of these plants do better in leaner soils, but because the soil was so heavy and so devoid of really any um, any any organic component, we felt that it was a reasonable thing to do to add to all four. We won't be continuing to compost three of the four plots as like a ongoing thing. We are going to mulch them as well, and that will provide some slow release compost like component. Basically, we're going to use bark chips. Um, we call arborist chips. So a little different than mulch, but they'll have the same function as mulch and they will provide some um, benefit to the soil. So. Okay, thank Please you. Work. Is it one up here? Yeah, or in coming, different? coming. You're next. Yes, yes. Oh, thanks. Larry, I wanted to ask you a question about the trails um, that are being smoothed and made really quite uh, accessible to people. What will happen when the um, trees and the undergrowth on each side of the trail start to grow and start to possibly impinge upon the walking trail itself? Will there be someone from the staff or volunteers to clean up that growth. Well, ultimately, the management of the properties I have my, the management of the properties up to management, uh, and that includes the trails as well as the gardens and the you know all of it, all of the all the outdoors here as well as the interior is all up to management to maintain, and we have to. Uh, I'm sure that my committee will. Uh, make management aware, Tom Tango at the present time, uh, if there are uh, issues, problems with the uh, trail as uh, as time goes by. And, uh, you know, inevitably, uh, nature being what it is, things will grow where you don't want them to grow. Trees will fall down where you prefer they didn't, and so on and so forth. So that those are issues that will have to be dealt with as they occur. And to the extent that the, uh, my committee can uh, keep uh, tabs on that, we will do so. Good. Okay, Trina. Um, when we f uh, first moved here, Ray, oh, sorry. When we first moved here, Ray and Ann Smith put a camcorder up in a, a tree uh, where Woodland Pond was. And we, and they gave several wonderful presentations 
of what goes on at night around the pond. We saw fox, we saw beaver. Uh, it was just fascinating. And being able to see this, we felt we just owned the woods. In a, I mean, we don't. The animals do. I think there's a bald eagle down there, too. But let's consider uh, some people who would like to monitor a camcorder and put together an occasional program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in a partial answer to Sharon, uh, there's a permeable layer of landscape cloth under the gravel which will prevent things from growing up through it. In, the, in one of the pictures, you couldn't quite see it, but it's, been, it's being rolled out. Your second Your exercise. Yeah, that's okay. Um, gotcha. Will there be a covering above the gravel that will enable, say, somebody from the health center with a Roll later, be able to walk on it? Maybe. Hey, no, it's going to be at your own risk kind of thing. It's not going to be a guarantee. It's not paved. Yeah. So there's. The, the, uh, if I could speak to that for a moment, the, the, uh, yeah. the surface should uh, closely resemble the current surface of the Walk Hill Valley Rail Trail which some of you I know are familiar with, either having walked on it or lately perhaps taken a pet pedicab ride on it. And uh, bicycles use that all the time without a difficult, well, difficulty. Uh, fa young families with uh, strollers use it. I've seen that. Uh, Sorry for sure. Marl and I walked every inch of those trails over the six years before uh, strokes made their, uh, had did their thing with us. And uh, I can tell you that there's anything with wheels that was not powered uh, was able to use that trail, including horses. Now, it's a question as to whether we're going to have horses up here. But uh, in general, that surface uh, is very friendly to uh, wheeled vehicles. I'm not talking about tanks or uh, dump trucks, you know, light vehicles. It's not flat, so it's... Yeah. yeah, so unlike the rail trails, unlike the, unlike the rail trails um, uh, with, with one or two exceptions on the rail trails, the rail trails are uh, level. Uh, that's, you know, they're built for trains and trains don't go up and down steep hills very well, as you know. Uh, but um, the, the maximum allowed grade of our trail uh, under the U.S. Forest Service standards is 5%, okay? So if someone can deal with that amount of steepness and it's not very steep, uh, then it's usable. Okay. Yeah. You know, I see so much grass that it's dead and I can't imagine how do you get it back? I never see anybody thatching it there's no water, seeding, replacement of sod, maybe because I'm from the city. How do you how are you going to get that grass back to life? Um, Let's leave that one out there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think just it's, it has water. Water will bring it back, but. Are you answering? It'll come back. Wait, I just want to see if she's answering. Yeah, you know, we we have we have this uh, drying out of the grass problem every time we have we have drought conditions here, and and the grass does come back. You just have to water it, and water it, and water it, and then it will it'll get green again. It's a natural defense. It's, it's a natural defense of the plant, actually, to dry up so that it doesn't, uh, the roots don't die. Is that, how's that, Carol? Is that right? Carol says that's right. Okay. Uh, I have uh, two questions, but I would like uh, that Larry's map of the trail, 
if it could be put up on the screen. Give me a minute. Right now? Right now, so I could talk about sure. uh, the question, the two questions. Yeah. It'll be easy for the audience to see okay. what sure. I have a question about. As soon as uh, our master of ceremonies uh, finds it. I'm so By the way, just to remind you, that same map is part of the uh, design uh, proposal that's about 18 pages long up on the table, up at the front yeah. of the room. No, right near the top, Tom. My top, not your top. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Can you make, can you make that larger? Uh, the lights off too. Um, if you hit, hit slide show and then add current, current, yeah, current slide. Oh, great. Current slide. Over there. Yeah, that's it. All right, Larry and. Uh, oh, okay. great. Fantastic. Yes. All right. The blue trail will be the final uh, development of the trail, correct? Correct. Yes. Now, there is a trail, part of that trail which is in orange, and also another part of the trail that goes around the retention pond. Now, uh, maybe Dave could show where the retention pond is. Yeah, and show the trail because it's real. It's pretty clear. Uh, no, it's over here. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, that's that's that, that is not. The hold it just a moment. This trail you can cut in through here, around the retention pond. Yes, and come out. Yes. Uh, now that is usually plowed by the gardening or landscaping committee, or it's the, mowed. The, it's, it's a mowed. work order it's that was mowed. Already. mowed. What and did it's I not say? An official trail. It's mowed. It's now, not part of any official trail here. It's not official. No. But it le it allows access. Yes. To uh, a trail that is managed by June, Finer, uh, leading into the Millbrook Preserve. Now, what I'm saying is, will that area around the uh, uh, pond be plowed? Continue to be plowed. Mode, oh, mode, yes. mode, Look. yeah, mode. That is, that's not part of the trail that is being improved. But will so, it, what management does now, I presume, will continue to be done. Which is a mode. Well, I remember it. They yeah. do not plow it. If there's okay. snow, if there's snow, forget it. That's yeah. not well, plowing. I've worked down there, and you've walked there too, yeah. uh, and many of us have walked that trail around the retention pond. It's that not was, a trail. I want to emphasize. Well. It's, it's a, a path. It's a, a mode path. Grassy path. Correct. Now, he wants to can the mowing equipment from that company make their way down the blue trail to get to that yes. area? Will it yes. be yes. mowed or just allowed to grow wild? Well, if you've, as you know, Artie, because you've been down there many times, the trail per se will only be a small portion of what is actually a gravel road down to the retention pond. They will be able to use the mowers down that gravel road and get to the pond. So yes. They plan to do that. What management plans to do, you better ask management. But okay. that's, if uh -huh. that's what they're doing now, they should be able to continue to do it if they want to. Dave, the section that's in blue is the new straightaway. Yes. Okay, so for people to know, the orange trail was wet. It was difficult to manage and yes. to walk through. Yes. Okay. They won't need, nobody who walks on it starting in a week or two will even need to worry about that piece. Right. It'll be obvious where the trail goes. The, uh, one of the slides that Larry showed that showed uh, first some gravel and then the rolled stuff and then dirt, that's actually... This section here, I took the picture Saturday. It's this section here that you're looking at. Yeah. So the, the work's done, the work is, has begun on that already. Yeah. Quite a bit of work has been done there. Yeah. Um, I don't see any more hands, but maybe because I don't see the headlights on yet. <laughs> okay, Artie, we're hey, done with that. Thank you. All right, any um, 
Anyone else? Yes. Well, well, all right. I will motion that the residents association meeting for June is now adjourned. Go forth and enjoy. <laughs>